This is Global Health with Universidad de La Sabana. Uh, I'm Gail Fraser and this is Unit 4 and this is the first part where we're going to be talking about the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. So the main emphasis for this particular part of our discussion is related to infection prevention and summarizing information that what relates to the Ebola outbreak. So it was very much in the news, Ebola outbreak in West Africa. This particular time it was 100 times more serious than previous smaller outbreaks because this is something that is actually not new to East and Central Africa. So Ebola hemorrhagic fever, uh, the, 2000 and the 2014 outbreak we had more than 9,000 confirmed cases and half of those uh, died. So we're looking at 45,000 people who died. So this is the areas in which were affected. So you see we've got Liberia, which is the country we're particularly focusing on in this particular um, discussion. Liberia here in, in West Africa, Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, and you can see that, that other countries were also affected, but in different years. So the Republic of Congo, here in the middle, and Gabon, uh, there have been outbreaks, uh, there are smaller ones, over many decades. So this is not a new virus. And then, of course, Sudan. One of the different things is this particular time, Ebola virus was not self-contained and we had the spread internationally of this infection because of West African travelers coming through Europe and then flying to the United States and also we had people that were exposed in West Africa that were brought directly to the emergency care in European and North American hospitals. The spread of Ebola virus, again, these are things that we can monitor on the World Health Organization website. It's a very good source of information because you can rely on them being accurate and only reporting the confirmed cases. So if there's any confusion about infection spread, irregardless of whether it's uh, avian influenza or chikungunya fever, or you can always rely on the World Health Organization to have all the correct and most recent up-to-date figures. So we have cases that were in the United States. Uh, it was, there were cases that had spread to Spain because of travelers from West Africa. And so this got to be, there were concerns that this epidemic or outbreak in West Africa was going to become pandemic, meaning it's going to affect many countries in the world. The Ebola and the Marlboro virus are a mysterious viral group because they cause the death of the host so quickly that very often it is self-limiting, very small communities that uh, the populations are affected and it doesn't spread beyond these smaller regional areas. So they the way this disease works is not well understood. It has a natural history of having re animal reservoirs, so they think that it could be spread by monkeys or bats. And it is, there are lots of things that are known about the particular virus, but the current outbreak was in Liberia and Nigeria. It spread to Nigeria because people from other poorer countries in West Africa actually traveled to Nigeria to get better health care. Sierra Leone, uh, Senegal, Democratic Republic of Congo, United States, and Spain. As we mentioned, the reservoirs are not well identified, but they assume primates and bats could be among the carriers of Ebola virus and its direct contact with blood or secretions from, from an even animal to a human. So naturally bats and monkeys are uh, part of the food uh, sources for people who live 
in lots of places in Africa. They hunt these animals just like uh, we hunt deer or other types of uh, forest animals. The, so when they're hunting and, uh, and killing these animals, the blood gets on them. Blood secretions from a very acutely ill person with Ebola will be a source of transmission. So the incubation period is a typical viral uh, infection, 2 to 21 days. This particular outbreak in 2014, they were saying the average amount of time was about 8 days before you became symptomatic. Infections are acute and mostly deadly, so the death rate is very, very high. And you can get additional information. There's the web page. So this was the one of the illustrations that they had. This was actually from Southeast Asia. They were publishing the deadly Ebola virus information. So they're showing here um, places in South Asia where the transmission might be related to bats, but also other types of primates like gorillas, um, chimpanzees, porcupines, and then they also identified antelope as being a potential carrier. So again, and they were showing the different locations and the number of cases. So you can see Uganda and uh, Democratic Republic of Congo had the longest uh, number of cases in this particular outbreak is the lighter orange bar. But then in 2014, countries that don't normally have Ebola, there were many, many, many more cases. So Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. As far as the actual disease path for Ebola, so the pathogenesis, it enters the bloodstream through the skin or the membranes in your eyes, your mouth, and then cracks in your open skin, meaning that uh, where you have damaged skin surfaces, it binds to your cell membrane. It's a viral RNA uh, virus. So again, it takes over the, like any other viral infection, it takes over the functioning within the cell. The regional virus threats, again, there are other viruses that we have to be concerned about and there was a brand new virus very similar to the SARS virus that we had in 2003. Again, we we're talking about viral illnesses, so are we talking about flying swine flu? Or are we talking about mad cow? You have to have some sense of humor when you're dealing with these very serious illnesses, but uh, I was very concerned about the Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome, and again, the number of cases has been restricted to Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar, uh, UAE, but again international travelers have spread it to France and Spain and other places in the United in in the world and there have been a total of just over 300 deaths. I think the number of cases has actually increased since I looked at the data in October. It's uh, it's over 900 now. So you can see another virus that I get concerned about is uh, Saudi Arabia people, Muslims who travel during the Hajj to Mecca. And that's in, it varies depending on the time of uh, the shift in the, in the year. But September is when the Hajj is in next year. And, and again, you have all these crowding of people together in Mecca. So you have an opportunity for spreading viral diseases, especially respiratory diseases like influenza. So again, the United States responded very strongly to uh, talking about infection control, hand hygiene, when it talked about Ebola, you talk about influenza, the, the actual recommended prevention is all the same. And we see a lot of publications, you know, wash your hands often and carry on. This was the British format for, you could see we have the WHO, the uh, spring of the this protective garb for people who were taking care of uh, the Ebola patients and also the people who had died. Prevention and treatment consistent hygiene. No special treatment is available for Ebola 
unfortunately the, they just do supportive treatment much like uh, if you get dengue or some of these other viral infections. I know that while you're traveling, you should avoid contact with people who are sick. Wash your hands open uh, often, and uh, if soap and water is not available, then use hand sanitizer. But again, keep your hands away from your face, and that's the biggest thing. Uh, so it's much like preventing influenza. For our youngsters, I mean, clean the clean team, and do we need a a timer for how long we we wash our hands. I know my grandson, he's a speed washer. And so you have to really make sure that when you're traveling especially, that the kids wash their hands for the longer time. I know you've probably all seen these posted around the university and different places about how to wash your hands, how to use hand rub. Because after all, this is what it's like. Would you Would you like your to eat a hamburger with a hand that's been like your shoe. But I thought that was really a good illustration because again, it's it's just like your hand has been a lot of places, even maybe tying your shoes. The recommended universal precautions for the protective equipment, again, they've improved that so that they actually had some nurses that were exposed to Ebola virus when they were taking care of patients. And uh, so that wasn't good. And we have different videos and recommendations about donning or putting on or doffing, taking off your PPE. There are a lot of different uh, videos and training materials are being developed. I know my office at Texas A&M has been working with the Centers for Disease Control. Here's one thing that was developed right here in Pan American Health Organization. It's available in Spanish also. Um, the Protect Patty, again, as a little review of putting on PPE safely. I thought it was really a nice one. Routine immunizations. Again, I'm going to go through a lot of these things quickly because you have available in your book as well. Uh, and then current vaccine recommendation. There is no vaccine for it, but it is being developed and they have some candidates, which is really good. And one of the things that you might consider doing is uh, volunteering with the International Federation of Red Cross when these types of emergencies come up because 14 countries across the world they sent volunteers to help um, with routine tasks that you wouldn't even necessarily have to be exposed to patients but you could be doing the logistics and helping transport materials and so on. Again the US uh, Army went in and built some camps. I have a video that I hope to show you at the end. Resources that you need to look at. Again, European Centers for Disease Prevention. I like Medline Plus. Mayo Clinic Centers for Disease Control provides a lot of information to the World Health Organization. So you'll find that they have really excellent uh, teaching tools, information, correct information if you are curious about how best to help others. The CDC keeps a monitoring for updates for Ebola. World Health Organization, again, keeps all the updated statistics. And then this is the website. I thought this European Commission was really quite good because you, you just uh, use your, your mouse and touch on different countries and it'll give you the information on Spain or what's happening in Sweden or different, so it was interactive map that actually gave you updates about the Ebola virus. I think that's the last slide. There we go. So then again, these are the different things that are being done specifically in, in West Africa and Central Africa. You can see they've got a lot of different materials that they're using. And of course, these would be translated into the national languages. So this ends part one of unit four and the next we'll go on to the discussion. This is Global Health Unit 4 and this is the second part of our discussion and I'm Gail Fraser. The, in contrast to what was happening in West Africa I wanted to talk about the ethnic health disparities and this is the most severe form because in race and 
health disparities, the contrast between East Africa and West Africa is dramatic. Uh, the case study that we're looking at is we're comparing Liberia with the Ebola outbreak and the, uh, the, the, the breakdown of the health system, the weak health system that allowed the outbreak to become so gigantic and allow so many thousands of people to die of an infectious disease. They just didn't have adequate uh, materials to actually care for their own people. And this is through long, long term uh, allowing the health system to just stay unimproved. And there were lots of things that we could have done over the decades to prevent this type of flare-up where we have an enormous uh, outbreak of a disease that we've been watching and seeing you know since the 70s we've been watching this disease uh, have these violent attacks in small clusters around West Africa and basically we haven't helped to do anything to strengthen the health systems in West Africa. Well the same thing happened in Rwanda. The United Nations, the world community as a whole, did nothing to respond to clear evidence there was a genocide going on in Rwanda. And we, no one took action quickly enough. So this is a contrast to, this was West Africa, this is happening in Central and East Africa, where we're, doc we're documenting the genocide that's actually worse than war. And these are the types of contrasts that you'll see because, again, there's so many different countries in Africa and the cultural diversity even within one country is enormous. But across a whole continent, you can see there are enormous global health challenges there. And so I decided this semester I would make shaking, ha Shake Hands with the Devil that's about the Rwanda genocide, an excellent um, film, but it's quite a long film that we would not be using the film in the regular class, but you could use it as extra credit. So this is one of the ways that if you've fallen behind or you, you haven't uh, had a chance to complete your homework as completely as you would prefer, you can get some extra credit by actually watching this video and writing a summary for me of how you feel about the actions that happened uh, during the Rwanda genocide. So genocide is worse than war and I think that the documentation that is listed, we're talking about making comparisons to <clears throat> Nazi Germany, the, the genocide of Jews, uh, Rwanda, the ec ethnic cleansing, the, the Tutsi genocide, and it, it's even closer to home in, in more uh, distant times, and I think it was a, in the uh, late 60s that Guatemala government was trying to annihilate uh, all the Mayans because they were, the, again, the, the native tribes and they were uh, being discriminated against. So the, it happens throughout the world. It's not just something that happens in Africa. It happened in Europe. It happened in South in Central America. So look at the cultural diversity you have in in South America. I mean, like, as I mentioned, take Colombia. The can you even understand people <laughs> from the Caribbean coast? I mean, the accent is very distinctly different from people who live in other parts of Colombia. Colombia Spanish is very soft, and it's actually one of the best respected uh, Spanish accents uh, outside of Spain because of it is soft. But if you also look at the cultural diversity of people who live on the Pacific coast or in Amazonia, even in Llanos, in the in the more remote areas to the east. So again, there, Colombia itself 
is very diverse within it within its own country and so you can understand the complexity of dealing with cultures and societies in Africa because you can see how big Africa is. This is that picture I was talking about, the fact that the United States fits within just uh, the one part of Africa. All of China could fit into uh, the central part of and southern part of Africa. Here is uh, all the different countries. Europe just all fits in here. Here's India. So you can see that Africa continent is so much bigger than the rest of the world. And so the diversity shouldn't be surprising when you realize how big it is. So when we're talking about genocide, and it's something that happened long enough ago that maybe you hadn't read about it, but it actually means to try to eliminate um, a, an individual race or group. And the United States, sorry, the United Nations Convention to eliminate any racial discrimination is, is, is strong and it says that there should not be or prohibits any form of discrimination against people, groups, or organizations. So this, an ethnic group would be a group. Um, people that have a certain religion would be a group. So the, anybody who adopts the United Nations conventions also adopts the fact that, that we shouldn't be discriminating. But this is definitely what happened. There was, there was different racial groups within Rwanda and they had physical characteristics that were distinct. And the, it was a catastrophe. Rwanda, you can see it's right next to, just south of Uganda, and it shares a border with Tanzania. So here's Uganda, here's Rwanda, it's a very small country. Here's Tanzania, here's Kenya. So you can see, and then this is the Democratic Republic of Congo, the, this big central country here. So between April and June, so April, May, June, three months, in 1994, an estimated 800,000 Rwandans were killed in 100 days. This is a genocide. Most of the dead were Tutsi, ethnic tribe, and their perpetrators of the violence were Hutu. The genocide was sparked by the death of a Rwandan president and the, who was a Hutu tribe leader. When his plane was shot down, in Kilgari, which is the capital of Rwanda, in 1994. In Kigali, the presidential guard immediately initiated a campaign, and again, this was Hutu rebel-led, and at that time, the Tutsis, which is the other ethnic group, they knew they were in danger, and they rushed out to other countries, so they went to Republic of Congo, they went to Tanzania, they were refugees in other countries because they were afraid. The UN peacekeepers were sent in. They knew this catastrophe was happening. Over a million dead and families uh, separated, neighbors killing neighbors, and they did nothing. I know in the United States, it was long enough ago that it was President uh, William Clinton who was the President of the United States at the time, and he couldn't believe that what he was hearing. I mean, they were notifying the United States, they were notifying the UN, all the UN countries, and no one intervened, no one, even though they knew full well what was happening. So you see, this is what the point is, that we all knew that the Ebola outbreak was happening in West Africa and did nothing to support the health systems, to improve things. In Rwanda, we knew that a massive racial discrimination, a genocide was occurring, yet no action was taken. And this is one of the things that was one of my original questions in Unit 1, is that why should we care about Africa? 
And it, it's actually a question about humanity and how we manage to relate to one another in different cultures. So our discussion, I'm challenging you to really think about these two very different kinds of examples and how they relate to health disparities and discrimination based on race or national origin. And I'm remembering what U.S. Uh, President Obama said in 2012 during his acceptance speech. Hope is a thing inside of us that insists, despite all evidence to the contrary, that something better awaits us. If we have the courage to reach out for it and work for it and fight for it, and we shall win the day, but as the day the world declared in one voice, we will not go quietly into the night. We will not go quietly into the night. We will not vanish without a fight. We're going to live on. These are the types of uh, questions that you have to face when you're thinking about these types of things that have happened that are wrong. They're evil. They're things that should never have happened in a world that cares about other people. So I'm challenging you to watch these videos. I'm going to be playing the U.S. Troops Ebola uh, video because that's three minutes. But I'm challenging you to watch the Rwanda summary by Jean-Michel, which is about 12 minutes. And then I want you to join questions about these three questions in the discussion forum. What are the similarities between the United Nations response to Ebola versus the genocide in Rwanda, and how were they different so that the cases were different, and recommend long-term solutions to this type of problem. How can we motivate change so that this could never happen again, that people will always reach out, people will always care about even remote countries. These are the basics of global health. We have to have compassion and be willing to inconvenience ourselves. We need to be able to actively help or design programs or projects that could help. So let's go ahead and watch the video about the U.S. troops and go ahead and put your answers to these questions for on the discussion forum on Virtual Savannah. Thanks. Trending since last week, and in a recent Washington Post ABC News poll, nearly two thirds of Americans. I think I found the wrong, I pulled up the wrong video. Okay. It happens. <laughs> Unit four. Well, I'm a military soldier, and I love to see uh, military aircraft come in. So, absolutely, I'm excited. It's a great day. After weeks of preparation, the sound of aircraft overhead signals a new phase in Major General Darrell Williams' mission. The weather is tough, the terrain is tough, the infrastructure is challenging, and so these tools that you see coming in will give us the ability to operate with confidence and strength. Williams has the unenviable job of leading the fight against an invisible enemy. We're glad you're here, man. Hoorah. Hoorah. Tasked by President Obama to help stop the spread of Ebola. Hey, come on over here. Hey, get on. And the clock is ticking. Yeah, so this is how you make a hotel into an operational center. And so it's Today he's conducting what they call a battlefield circulation tour of his Joint Forces Command. This is how we ensure that we stay safe. But this battlefield requires a different kind of vigilance. Hey, carry on. How's everybody doing? Oh. All right, take your seats. In a cramped conference room in a Liberian hotel, the operations nerve center, they've had to hit the ground running, fitting in where they can, conscious that delays cost lives. This will